we'll start in a minute once we've given some time for uh, attendees to join. So if you're just joining us, we're, we're going to give it um, another 30 seconds and then we'll, we'll, we'll start the webinar once a few more attendees join. So I think we can uh, start our presentation today, our webinar for today. So I'd like to say hello um, to everyone um, joining us and welcome to the webinar today. Uh, it's entitled The Role of International Carbon Markets in India and it's hosted today by um, Parvara Mitra and Carbon Market Watch. Uh, my name is Andrew Corley and I'm the Network Campaign Manager for Carbon Market Watch and I'll be ushering us through the proceedings today and hopefully um, with few hiccups because I will be uh, also helping with the technical side of things. Um, so uh, we, will, we anticipate that this will um, be a one and a half hour session um, and we would like to welcome our speakers um, from India, um, uh, Mahesh Falguni and Gilles. But um, I would also like to give them the floor to uh, briefly introduce themselves. So, um, Falguni, if you would like to say hello first. Uh, hello, good evening. And uh, my name is Falguni Joshi. I'm working with Paryavaran Mitra Organization. And welcome to this webinar. Mahesh Pai. Hello. Uh, namaskar to uh, all. I am Mahesh Pandya, also from the same organization where Falgun is coming. It's called the Paryavaran Mitra, uh, Friends of Environment. And uh, I'm happy that uh, in collaboration with the Carbon Market Board, uh, we are having this uh, webinar, and which is uh, essential and today's need to uh, do this kind of webinar and give information about the uh, carbon market and uh, uh, greenhouse uh, emission uh, trading. Uh, because recently, you see the the report came out from the uh, the uh, the U.S.-based uh, Health Effect uh, Institute, uh, which is called the State Global Air, and see the figure: the millions of the people are dying because of the air pollution, uh, even in uh, globally as well as in India. And the Corona death is there, but the thousand times more people are dying due to the air pollution, which is called the gas emission. And that is why there is a need to discuss about this uh, carbon market and trading uh, because it's as a matter of the uh, life of the people. The life span of the people are reducing. Uh, but on the other end, the, uh, the corona as well as the carbon credit or carbon market is an opportunity for some people and disaster for many. And that is why there is urgent need to discuss uh, about this issue. And uh, again, uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, Andrew. I'm welcoming uh, all uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Pranesh. Shield. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. I'm Gilles Dufran. I'm a policy officer at Carbon Market Watch, where I follow the international negotiations around carbon markets. Okay, thanks, everyone. Um, so, our um, well, this this webinar is actually um, part of a three-part series webinar um, with, that we are doing with our partners in Latin America. Uh, Africa and, and, and here in India. Um, I, uh, what we're hoping that we can w achieve with this webinar is to um, share knowledge with, uh, with you, the, the, the listeners or the viewers, um, on the developments of market mechanisms, um, what will be happening or maybe that hasn't been happening um, on the international negotiations and hopefully drawing on some of your comments, questions and knowledge um, to help us develop um, more uh, civil society engagement um, in, in future uh, relating to market mechanisms um, under the Paris Agreement as they, as they unfold. Um, so we would love to hear your thoughts and questions. Um, uh, for the purposes of this webinar, if you can use the Q&A um, box uh, to, uh, to post your questions. And when we get to the, the Q&A session at the end, following our presentations, um, we, will, uh, we will try to get through as many as possible. And thanks already to, to those who have um, submitted their questions in the registration form. Um, you can put a few uh, clarification questions throughout uh, the presentations, and we'll try to get to those um, if they're related. Uh, so, without further ado, um, I will pass it over to my colleague Gilles um, from Carbon Market Watch to kick things off with his presentation. And um, yeah, I would say, Gilles, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Andrew. I will share my screen with everyone. So. Again, thanks everyone for joining this webinar. Um, this is meant as uh, information sharing and, and building better connections between all of us interested in, in climate policies and, and climate change in general. In my presentation here, the objective is to give you an overview of what international carbon markets are, how they function, what are the challenges um, faced by, by these markets, and trying to link it as much as possible to the local level, to the regional level, and, and talking about the, the very real world impact of these markets, not just focusing on the kind of abstract um, market level discussion. So having said that, I realize that probably there will be quite a different uh, level of knowledge among the audience. So I will, I will start from the, from the beginning to explain what cow, bar, what cow markets are and what we're talking about here. So, the first um, element, if I manage to switch my slide, here it is. The first element that I want to cover is to really clarify what we're talking about. So here we're talking about a system through which entities can exchange achieved emission reductions. What this means is that you have a project, a climate mitigation project that is implemented in a specific country, in a specific region, and this project reduces emissions. And the emission reductions achieved through that project are purchased by another entity. So whether it's an airline or a country, even a private individual, somebody will be purchasing those emission reductions and using them to claim that their own emissions don't have an impact on the climate. So that they have emitted a ton, but they are paying for a reduction somewhere else. Um, and so it's kind of a net zero impact. And that's the concept of offsetting, which I'm, I'm sure some of you will have heard already. And so we're very much focusing on the type of carbon market where emission reductions are exchanged. So achieved emission reductions through a specific project. And I know I realize I'm, I'm repeating this a lot. Um, and for some of you, it might be obvious. But the reason I'm repeating this is because there are different types of carbon markets. And the one we're focusing on today is sometimes called the baseline and credit system, or more simply just an offsetting system. Again, it's this idea that you're, you're trading achieved emission reductions. So it's, the, it's what you can see in the, in the column on the right-hand side of this table. 
And this is different from other carbon markets or market-based policies such as a carbon tax or an emissions trading system. For example, on an emissions trading system, what happens is that companies receive pollution permits, essentially, which are called allowances. And for every permit they hold, they're allowed to emit one ton of CO2 equivalent. Most of the time, that's how it's set up. This means that the companies are trading permits which allow them to emit carbon um, or greenhouse gas emissions in the future. So this is different from what we're talking about here today, which are offsetting system where once again, you're trading achieved emission reductions. So I hope, I hope this uh, clarifies it for, for some of you, um, hopefully for all of you. And now we can, we can dive a bit more into the topic of um, carbon markets and specifically baseline and credit systems. So first of all, I wanted to give you an overview of the structure of carbon markets. And I divided it in four categories here. Um, it's a very stylized way of presenting it. So it's a bit, it's a simplification of course, but I think it's helpful to understand what are the different areas um, where emission reductions can be, can be traded. So first on the left-hand side, you see, you see Kyoto, which refers to the, the Kyoto Protocol. Under the Kyoto Protocol, there are three carbon markets established. The Clean Development Mechanism, which I imagine some of you will be familiar with, and also Joint Im Implementation and International Emissions Trading. So these are three systems. The most well-known one is the Clean Development Mechanism, which essentially allowed developed countries to purchase emission reductions from developing countries and use those reductions to meet their own um, targets under the Kyoto Protocol. Now, the CDM is quite famous or infamous, um, sadly, because it had many shortcomings and essentially failed at reducing emissions. And in some cases, it also um, harmed local communities or the environment. And that's one of the reasons why a new set of carbon markets was established under the Paris Agreement. And so now we're moving on to the second section um, where you can see the two yellow um, circles, which represents the two systems established under the Paris Agreement, specifically under Article 6. And I'm going to explain a bit more what these are about uh, in the later slide. So for now, what's, what's useful for you to, to remember is that there are two carbon markets established under the Paris Agreement and that they essentially replace the ones um, established under Kyoto. Third up is the um, aviation carbon market, Corsia, the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation. This is a market established under um, the UN Agency for Civil Aviation. So we're no longer talking about the UNFCCC, the climate agency, but now we're talking about the Civil Aviation Agency. And this market essentially requires airlines to compensate the growth in their CO2 emissions from international flights above 2021, um, from 2021, sorry. Now, of course, there are lots of specificities and, and technical details for how this works. It's not really the, the objective of this webinar to go into that. So for, for the purpose of this webinar, it's, it's uh, enough to remember that there is this market um, and that therefore airlines will be purchasing some um, carbon credits, which is something they already do on a voluntary basis. So you might have seen announcements from different from airlines around the world um, claiming that they are operating carbon neutral flights or reducing their footprint by a certain percentage by purchasing carbon credits. And this happens under the so-called voluntary market. And this is the fourth category on this slide on the far right. Um, this voluntary market is where private companies will purchase offsets, will purchase emission reductions to claim to be compensating for their own climate impacts. So when you hear, for example, from Microsoft or others who are claiming that um, they have reduced their footprint by a certain percentage, often um, a share of those reductions are actually through offsets. And so the companies are purchasing these emission reductions on the voluntary market where certain organizations um, act as, as standards or as labels. So it's a sort of guarantee label um, for example, you might have heard of the gold standard or the voluntary carbon standard. Um, of course, it's not because credits um, have this label that they are all perfect and there are, there are still very large um, shortcomings with the, the concept of offsetting, which in any case 
simply aims for for a net zero um, for having a, a a zero impact because you are continuing to emit somewhere and reducing somewhere else and so you can even in this so-called zero sum game where you're not really reducing emissions but just compensating but anyway this is the the structure that i wanted to to give you i think it's a bit it's kind of helpful to visualize how these markets are organized of course in reality it's much more complex because the different systems actually interact with each other and i know the table here is very small it's not meant for you to to read it and go into all the details but rather it's to to give you an example of how the they can be visualized in a bit more uh, of a realistic way and you can find this entire table in our guide the carbon markets 101 guide you see the cover page here it's on our website um, and there you will find more information about what the exact linkages are. But for now, it's, it's useful to, to think about them in these different categories if, if you're new to this topic. So now that I've clarified this, I wanted to dive a bit deeper into Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Um, again, Article 6 is the article which establishes new carbon market mechanisms under the Paris Agreement. It's become quite um, famous because it's been the focus of uh, discussions at the previous COP, um, as well as COP24, so the year before that. And still, despite all these discussions, um, there hasn't been an agreement yet. And so there are a lot of um, climate policy observers still wondering what's going to happen to this part of the negotiations. Um, Article 6 is split into three systems one of which is a so-called uh, non-market, is a framework for non-market approaches. So I'm not going to focus too much on this because here we're talking about, um, about carbon markets, but just to let you know that there is a, a framework for so-called non-market approaches in Article 6. But the two, um, two market mechanisms under Article 6 are article, so-called Article 6.2 and 6.4. So they are distinct um, systems. Article 6.2 is a system which allows countries to exchange emission reductions through so-called cooperative approaches. So essentially, you can think of it as a system that allows bilateral agreements between countries where one country will say, well, I have reduced my emissions by more than what I was um, supposed to do or what by more than what my target required and so i will sell these extra reductions to another country so this very much happens on a bilateral or multilateral basis without really requiring a centralized governance system and then you have article 6.4 which is different in its nature because it functions much more like the cdm for those of you who are familiar with it so the idea is that you're implementing specific projects and issuing credits but all of this is governed by specific rules and the credits can then be accessed by um, any entity whether it's a country or, or a company and there you, you don't go through bilateral agreements but rather you rely on on an overall um, governance structure and this has implications for the negotiations because as you can see in the in the last line at the bottom of this uh, table if there is no agreement under Article 6 at the, at the UNFCCC, this doesn't mean that there's not going to be any common market because under Article 6.2, as I said, countries are free to enter into bilateral agreements. And so there will still be these, um, these trades probably between, between countries. And that's why it's important for civil society to be aware of, of these mechanisms um, and, and to keep an eye out for what the real impacts will be of these um, of these trades. So now that I hopefully have clarified what the different systems on the Article 6 are, I wanted to dive into three specific issues. The first one is the question of the excess supply of credits on the market. The second one is the question of the risk of counting a single reduction multiple times. And the third one is a question of preventing negative impacts on local communities and the environment. So first of all, for the first issue, the discussion about the oversupply, the situation at the moment is that there are essentially too many credits um, available for purchase. Under the CDM, there are very many um, projects that were implemented and credits that could be available for purchase. 
the objective here is not really to dive into those numbers and give you a very technical explanation of demand and supply, but rather what I want to do is talk about how this has an impact at the local level and how it impacts the actual quality of the projects. So if demand is, is lower than supply, then the prices are going to be low. That's what we see on the market today. The CDM credits uh, are worth essentially nothing. They're worth 25 cents per, per credit. And credits on the voluntary market are worth around $3 per credit. Um, at least that was the price in 2018, which is the latest available. Um, and with low prices, that has a very real impact on project developers and on the quality of the projects because the low prices mean the developers don't get much money for the projects they are implementing. And if they don't get much money, then they also can't really implement high quality projects and they kind of focus on the, the easiest one and the ones where they can get most emission reductions for, for a cheap amount of money. That's actually the whole logic of, of these markets, trying to get as much as many reductions for as, as little money as possible. But this also means that we the market fails to kind of incentivize high quality projects that are more expensive to, to put in place and that really uh, bring communities together and where, where individuals at a local level can participate because these are, tend to be more expensive. So we end up with a system where the low quality projects kind of dominate the, the supply and so people lose confidence because you are just not con uh, confident enough that what you are purchasing is um, a high quality carbon offset or high quality emission reduction, which means that there is a bit less demand because people doubt whether these systems are, are good or bad and, and for very good reasons, because indeed the, the systems uh, generally lack uh, integrity at the moment. But my point here is that this kind of creates a circle, as you can see on the slide, you have low prices, which means developers don't get enough money. So they, they implement low quality projects. And this means people lose confidence and that drives low, less demand and so low prices. So you create this kind of circle. And so it's a problem for the local impacts and for the, the concrete um, quality of the projects that there is such oversupply at the moment. So it's not just like a theoretical uh, market analysis perspective. It's really, um, it has an impact in the real world. So the second um, aspect I wanted to cover is the risk of double counting. It might seem a little more abstract, um, but it's a very important aspect. And it's one question that has been um, creating big, big tensions within the, the negotiations. And basically the risk is, is this. When you implement a project to reduce emissions in a country, then obviously the emissions in that country decrease, assuming the project is, is a good project and you're actually reducing emissions, but let's assume that for now. So you're implementing a project which is, reduces emissions in country X, and then you have an entity, let's say another country, who is purchasing those reductions and counting them towards their own climate target. So you have the host country where the project is happening who is kind of seeing this reduction in emission and so counting it towards its own target and then you also have the buyer country who is counting the reductions so you end up in a situation where you have two countries claiming to have reduced their emissions but actually there's only one unit let's say one ton of um, greenhouse gases that has been that has been reduced and at that point, of course, it's a, it's a big problem because if we start counting reductions multiple times, then um, the whole logic of setting climate targets and trying to reduce emissions kind of, kind of falls apart because we're just not counting them um, appropriately anymore. Um, the solution to this is kind of basic, at least in its concept. It's to say, well, if the host country, if the country where the emission reductions take place sells the reductions to someone else, then it shouldn't be allowed to also count it towards its own target. And so the host country should basically correct its own accounts to say, well, I see I have reduced my emissions, but I'm not going to count it because I sold it to someone else. Of course, the implication of that is that the host country should be the one who decides whether it wants to sell or not the reduction. So the host country should be able to authorize or not um, a project because we don't want uh, buyers to basically take out all the reduction from a country and leave the country with in a difficult situation to meet its own target. So that's the problem of, um, of double counting. 
Now, coming to the third issue, and this is very much uh, linked to the, to the local level, um, this is the question of safeguards. So under the, under the existing markets, under the, the, the Kyoto Protocol, sorry, and the, the Clean Development Mechanism, um, there were missing safeguards, or the, the ones that were adopted were not respected um, and not applied sufficiently. So we ended up in a situation where several projects were implemented, and Faguni will give you a few uh, examples later on, several projects were implemented which had negative impacts at the local level on communities, on the environment, and where these local communities just didn't get involved in the projects um, because the project developers did not uh, consult with them, did not explain enough what the projects were, were aiming to do. And so two safeguards, at least two safeguards need to be uh, corrected in, in, the, in the new markets. There should be good rules for consulting local stakeholders um, and there should be a process for essentially for local communities to be able to register complaints if they are negatively affected by a project. So this is called the grievance mechanism. And there should be a way for, for people to make their voices heard um, at the international level when, when the market is having an impact on them. And now finally, if I can change my slide, here it is. Um, I wanted to, to conclude after having talked about what are the issues we're facing at the moment and how the market is structured at the moment. I wanted to conclude with a view of what we can expect from the future and what developments we're seeing um, these, today. Um, first of all, many of you will know that COP26 has been postponed to the end of 2021. Um, and this means that since the markets, since the carbon markets under the Paris Agreement will start operating from, uh, from the beginning of 2021, so from, from January next year, we will see, we will end up in a situation where countries will start to be able to trade emission reductions without clear rules on how this should happen. Um, and, and so this is why it will be particularly important for civil society and for, for NGOs to understand what these markets are about and to be able to monitor the, the real impacts of the, of the trades of the projects. Uh, we see that countries are already starting to implement some projects. For example, Switzerland is implementing some projects. And so um, definitely there will be a role uh, for civil society to monitor the real world impacts of these as has been done to some extent under the, under the CDM. At the same time, um, on the right hand side here, there's also dynamic um, happening on the voluntary market where private companies are increasingly interested in purchasing offsets. This comes from airlines, from oil companies and from other large polluters who are trying to basically portray themselves as, as um, you know, not as climate catastrophic as they actually are and purchasing uh, offsets to green their image. And so there's very much um, a, a renewed enthusiasm for, for carbon offset projects from the voluntary market at the moment. And the reason I'm, I'm saying all this is because it all kind of supports this idea that projects are getting implemented. So there is, there is a market, it is happening. And so regardless of whether you think carbon markets are a solution or not, um, it's important to be aware of what, what these systems are and how they operate and making sure that we can hold the project developers and the buyers of offsets accountable for the real impacts that um, their projects are having on the ground. And so we hope to be able to work with, with many of you um, and with many organizations around, around the world to really monitor the real world impacts of these markets. So to close, um, I just want to refer you back to our to our website. If you're if you're interested in, in this topic, you'll find um, lots of material to to explain what the systems are about. If you're new to the topic, I recommend that you read the Carbon Markets 101 guide. It's quite uh, helpful and will basically explain what I've been um, trying to explain here, but in more in more detail. Um, and please do contact us if you have any, any questions or if you're interested in, in getting involved in, in this, uh, these kinds of activities and monitoring the real impacts of, of these systems because that's very much something we will um, be looking forward to do over the coming, uh, coming years as, as carbon markets continue to be 
important elements or at least uh, being used a lot by, by companies and, and countries. So thanks very much for your attention. And now we will show a short video that kind of explains what are the different steps for implementing a project. So it's not meant as a guide for how, how you should implement a project, but rather trying to explain if you are confronted with a project in your, in your area, these are how projects are um, designed and implemented because there are very specific steps that have to be met on the card market. And so it's useful to understand um, at what steps local communities can make their voices heard, for example, and in general, how, how we go from just a project idea to actually selling um, carbon offset credits. So I think Andrew will uh, show that now. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jill. Uh, yes, I'll just get the video up now. Um, In the meantime, I see there are some questions in the q and I think we'll take them uh, after afterwards. Yeah. The dramatic effects of the climate crisis are already felt across the world. Unfortunately, the measures to halt it can also have negative impacts on people and the environment. To meet agreed climate targets, some countries and companies buy carbon credits, which represent emission reductions by a project. Let's have a look at how a project goes from a simple idea to generating purchasable carbon credits. And more importantly, how local communities can make their voices heard in the process. Because once harm is done, it is often too late to undo it. This is why local organizations should understand how these projects are developed and how communities can watch over them. But what should they watch out for? Firstly, most projects are registered under special standards, a sort of guarantee label. The three main global standards are the Clean Development Mechanism, the Voluntary Carbon Standard, and the Gold Standard. Each has its own rules, but they generally follow a similar structure. First is the project idea. The project developer thinks of a way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and takes up pen and paper to lay out the details. This is the first opportunity for those affected by the project to get involved through a stakeholder consultation, which many standards require and which the developer should organize in order to seek input. However, these rules are sometimes not applied. If local communities have not been consulted properly, they can register a complaint, as some programs share online contact details for it. For some standards, such as the Clean Development Mechanism, the host country must authorize the project, and this can be another opportunity for communities to engage. After detailing the project, the developer should get the idea reviewed by an external organization. A review that should include the comments received during the stakeholder consultation. If the project is deemed to have a positive expected impact and it meets the requirements set by the standard, it is validated and ready to be registered. After reviewing the result of the first two steps, the chosen standard will officially register the project. In some programs, this is another opportunity to voice concerns. If, for example, local communities were not properly consulted or their opinion was ignored. Once registered, the project can generate carbon credits for the stipulated number of years. The project is now getting started. If stakeholders are affected in any negative way at this stage, 
or were not properly consulted before the start of the project, they can still turn to the developers or the standard which certify the project and complain. Some standards have a specific procedure for this called a grievance mechanism and contact details are often found online. Throughout the project, the developer will monitor various parameters to make sure it can detail exactly how many tons of greenhouse gases were saved thanks to this project. This data is generally not public at this stage, but it is used later to know exactly how many carbon credits should be issued. Once the project is up and running, an independent auditor will verify that it is working according to plan. With this verification, using the data from the previous step, the auditor will confirm that emissions have been reduced and that carbon credits can be created. Once all these steps are completed, the developer can finally receive the carbon credits, which are created by the standard certifying the project. In most cases, for every ton of CO2E reduced, the project developer will receive one credit. The developer can now sell the credits or deliver them if they have already been purchased in advance. This is how carbon market projects come to life. Of course, this type of carbon market is not a long-term solution to stopping the climate crisis. Offsets are used to justify emissions elsewhere and therefore don't reduce overall emissions. But it's important that local communities know how these projects are implemented and how they can make their voices heard. Because regardless of how offsets are used, no climate project should harm people. So uh, we've uh, we've just got through a video which was um, uh, it, it, it went into a little bit more um, or recapped a little bit what um, Gilles has been saying um, throughout his presentation um, and actually um, it was very interesting because um, as as Gilles was presenting there was a question came in relating to um, the verification um uh programs uh that that go in through and i think this is a good time to reflect on this question um it's from Ab abjit um and he's asking um how to how are projects ver verified how the missions verified sorry and um what international mission verification programs are there so Jill, would you like to um, just give a clarification on that in relation to what your presentation sure. on the video? Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, maybe you will you will have found part of the answer already in the in the video, actually. But um, so the the main standards that exist to to verify or to to label the the projects and the credits that are issued. Um, are the, the CDM, which some of you will know, the gold standard, the verified, um, the, the VCS, the verified carbon standard. There are other programs um, in, in North America and in other, in other regions of the world. Generally, they follow a similar process where the programs specify the rules that the project must follow in order to be eligible for uh, receiving their label. And as was explained in the, in the video, the project developers must monitor the impacts of their projects throughout the, the implementation period. So they must basically measure the amount of emission reductions achieved and, and how these reductions were achieved. Then these reports are verified by an independent auditor. And based on that report, the carbon credits will then be, be issued. So the process is that the project developer gets the data then you have an independent verification and then the credits are issued based on that verification in practice one of the main issues is um, how you calculate the achieved emission reductions because you are you are calculating calculating it against a counterfactual so a scenario you're trying to imagine which is what would have happened without my project and in calculating that, there are a lot of assumptions and sometimes 
uh, the number of com credits that are actually generated can be can be inflated by by a lot. Um, but maybe I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, and um, otherwise it would take too much time for the webinar. But this is essentially the the idea and the basic behind the functioning of of these systems. Okay, very good. Thanks, uh, thanks, Shiel. Um So I think now what we can do is move on to our next presentation, and that's uh, by Falguni Yoshi and Mahesh Pandya from uh, Parvaramitra. Uh, so I will pass the floor over to you guys. I think Falguni will be starting. Thank you, Andrew. I think uh, Namaskar Subhasayam. Uh, role of international carbon markets in India. If you noticed, I started my talk with Sanskrit word Subhasayam, which means good evening. And uh, I just like our Indian. NDC uh, document, which uh, started with the sloka from Yajur Veda, which says, "Wishing peace in every elements on earth." It shows that Indian tradition of harmony, harmony between human and nature. But uh, that is a time of Vedas. Let's check if India is still uh, having such principle for governance or not. As we all knew, a Paris Agreement adopted in year 2015 is considered as a landmark step to fight climate change, and India ratifies it. India mentioned in it uh, NDC to reduce the emissions intensity of its GDP by 33 to 35 percent by year 2030 from 2005 level. Emission intensity is the level of GHG emissions per unit of economic activity, usually measured at the national level as GDP. At this point, I like to uh, add that India is the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases after China and US. India has per capita emission of 1.7 tons, and I think uh, we need uh, we are actually 130. 130 plus crores, which makes us the third largest emitter. Uh, so, in addition, in according to NDC, there is a big step, big push for renewable energy. Uh, we have to avoid coal and implement more RE options to reach target of 40 percent power from non-fossil fuel by 2030. Uh, if we, if I talk about third point, according to to, to 2019 report of forest survey of india the total forest cover of country is equal to 21 percentage around uh, it, uh india's uh, 21 percentage of india's total geographical land and uh, we put our ndc target to uh, to additional creating additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion a ton of co2 uh, from additional forest and tree cover this is actually india's commitment let's uh, now uh, see what india is acting right now so uh, after uh, there is a national action plan on climate change which was uh, declared by uh, prime ministers uh, launched by prime ministers council on climate change in 2008 it has eight core missions and uh, on specific areas which was and which is anchored by different ministries the mission is being revised in light of emerging scientific knowledge and with india's ndc just because it was launched in 2008 and now we are in 2020 uh, uh, as we all knew that india is a very big country and we will aware about the state center issues so it is important to know about the position at state level 
i like to uh, i am happy to share that the state action uh, plans on climate change have been prepared in line with national plan a national plan for common strategies and actions at all levels which uh, the the state action plans also aim to mainstream climate change concern in the state planning process so far 33 states and union territories have prepared their uh, action plans uh, i am actually you might be thinking that i am uh, not focusing on the subject but uh, we referred india's commitment and actions related to climate change issue as jills mentioned in his presentation carbon markets are one of the tools to tackle the climate change problem through decrease the quantity of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere he explained this slide and he explained the different types of carbon markets the, there are mainly two types of carbon markets one two types of system ets and offsetting i think both are both are uh, not working in same way they both have uh, different objectives and global carbon markets to date have been nearly exclusively uh, of offsetting mechanisms rather than emission trading system so better to focus on offsetting mechanism and from this slide i feel there is a one common known words which is cdm so uh, let's focus on cdm as uh, cdm is a mechanism in the kyoto protocol the central idea of kyoto protocol is is its requirement that countries limit or reduce their greenhouse gases gas emissions by setting the targets emission reductions to con economic value the cdm allows the emission reduction projects in developing countries to earn certified emission reduction which is cer uh, is equivalent to 1 ton of co2 uh, this cers uh, can be traded and sold and many of us are aware about this mechanism because cdm is known word to all of all of us in india uh, sustainable development and emission reduction those are those were two core ideas when we, they thought about the cdm i just like to remind that only uh, let's uh, have a look how many cdm projects are Uh, at present uh, uh, registered at uh, united nation framework convention on climate change uh, from this slide we can work we can know that there are india china is leading the uh, path and uh, india is second is at second place and if you are able to see that year wise if you notice that during year 2011 2012 and 2013 Uh, there are there are number of projects which are registered which were registered is higher in number than after the number goes down because the carbon market crashed down uh, and the price of the ser decreased to minimal minimum not minimal it's very less this is the data of the world and now let me take you to the india india level this is this data i obtained from the annual report of ministry of forest and environment and climate change uh, and it it is uh, giving the detail uh, as on 17 december 2019 so maybe you will find from earlier slide and this slide you may for like a slight di uh, difference it mentions that uh, we have a cdm authority national cdm authority ncdma which which is actually uh, giving host country approval to the projects and uh, till 17 december 2019 it gave accorded host country approval to th around 3000 projects and we have uh, 1670 projects registered at cdm executive board from india uh and uh, sectors are many uh, variety of sectors are there and uh, as you my, uh, as you can see we are, india is actually indian projects are gaining 12.57 percentage of total cer issued this is uh, actually very important because india is the second highest uh, india is having cd second highest cdm projects in the world and uh total around 
250 million of uh, CER issued to the Indian projects. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, we already men mentioned about carbon markets, but I like to mention one more issue regarding it. Uh, that is the issue of compliance market and voluntary market. As you, uh, many of you are aware about the voluntary market uh, uh, thing, but uh, let me clarify further because compliance markets are established to meet binding targets where voluntary markets are not backed by any mandatory go mandatory goals uh, with increase uh, increasing urgency for climate mitigation many are looking to the private sector to play an increased role with markets as one of the opportunity to take actions uh, voluntary carbon uh, market put focus is on environment integrity and sustainable development and ensure that the generated carbon credits are real verified and measurable contribution let uh, let me uh, take you to the uh, give you the example of the carbon uh, voluntary carbon markets uh, first is this is uh, vcs is uh, which is administrated by vera which is a not for profit organization and uh, there are total 1616 registered projects and among them 529 projects are from india so maybe now you can understand why i'm giving the detail about this voluntary market there are uh, vcs is a standard for certifying uh, carbon emission reductions and this program is the uh, major program at the world level so let me take you to the uh, other important player of the voluntary market that is gold standard which is having a 1700 plus projects from 18 different countries gold standard was established by international ngos as a best practice standards to ensure projects that reduce carbon emission under cdm uh, and which also contributed to the sustainable development so you can see that uh, in this uh, gold standard 284 listed projects are from india uh, and mostly from the energy sectors uh, carbon credits uh, from indian projects indian projects on carbon credits of 10 million uh, from this uh, platform and uh, i like to add that uh, this is uh, many cdm projects are also uh, a gold standard projects and which are still earning a good good uh, profit or good rewards uh, let me take you further and i like to uh, this is i give detail about the voluntary carbon market of the world let's turn to india as a growing economy and emerging climate leader india is in a process to establish voluntary carbon market india's proposal to develop voluntary carbon market was approved by world bank under partnership for market readiness program uh, which pro uh, that is actually in the process and it may be completed by the year 2020 only but let's see but india already tried few pilot projects let's have a look indian government has notified pet scheme in 2012 it has also uh, uh, agree uh, also uh, providing economic incentives for uh, emission of pollutants in three states for uh, via ets pilot projects uh, they the three states gujarat maharashtra and tamil nadu participated in that uh, and the other uh, option is renewable energy certificate mechanism which was launched in 2010 and that scheme rewards re renewable power producers with credits which can be sold to entities that have a renewable purchase obligations. And uh, last point to add that the last year on 5th June, World Environment Day, uh, a pilot ETS started for selected industries in Surat, uh, which is a place in Gujarat state, uh, that, uh, that is for the particulate matter, specifically for the air pollution, uh, to control the air quality, uh, which is also in a pilot mode. So let me get back to the CDM. We talked about different carbon markets, but known to clean development mechanism as India is having second highest projects in the world. And we somehow saw our experience of effects of CDM projects around us. This is the first registered project. 
and it is interesting to know that the first register cdm projects is from gujarat and our organization paryavaran mitra has special connection with that project there is a reason establishment of paryavaran mitra is linked with this project which is producing refrigeration gases in 1995 a public interest litigation was filed in gujarat high court to get justice by farmers of ranjit nagar villages of panchmal district they uh, actually the company were emitting fluoride in wastewater and air since the operation of the plant fluoride level in the area in air water and soil increased and borewell water was also damaged due to this uh, and a court uh, formed an expert committee in which our director was a member and later on paryavaran mitra started working as an enviro legal organization for pollution problems in rural areas when we heard this that same company was registered as a cdm projects naturally we like to we thought to check at the ground level and we uh, went there to check the situation uh, the cdm project was earning big profit but also spreading pollution in nearby areas discharge untreated effluent which contaminated ground water and people were suffering from health problems uh, and at that this point of time it is important to note that this project is no longer generating carbon credits it is a old project it is the it was the first project registered as the, at the cdm <coughs> but uh it it earned profitable cer but not followed the sustainable development objective but i am telling this is a learning for us you uh, you can uh, the gas leakage incident was also happened in this uh, company uh, many complaints were filed by local community groups uh, up to national human rights commission also they went uh, but uh, few promises were made few few small points were favored but still the situation was not very satisfied after checking at ground we approached the unf triple c uh, in 2006 for information on public consultation in in the cdm process regarding this company they advised us to approach the national uh, government as public consultation is a issue of host country after email conservation of around uh, 10 months one year they advise us unf triple c advise us that next time please put your comments at the validation stage of the any projects uh, not at the later on time so you can also think you can surely think that this is a old project and is not getting any benefit at present but it was an experience to learn and there is a another point of view to check we can argue after bad experience of from the first cdm pro project we can argue that industrial projects have pollution problems but what about the renewable energy projects uh, uh, at present 80 percentage of cdm projects are from renewable energy sectors so there is no harm uh, but the renewable projects are eco friendly in nature but this projects are using more lands they are mostly using common lands so people lose their livelihood options mostly especially the poor and vulnerable uh, people villagers who are dependent on co common land for their livelihood uh, they lo uh, lose their livelihood options and sometimes in construction activities the existing vegetation got damaged thing is the construction activities are carried out in bad manner without taking care knowing about few cases will give us the clear picture of how good projects good re projects can also making trouble let's see this is the this is an example of a large wind energy project established in kutch district it is good to produce clean energy but the implementation without considering local people is a problem the project renewed crediting period Uh, in 2017 and still operational so we check let's check the reality check the wind turbines are located uh, in the sureshbari creek which is biodiversity rich area the other point is if you ever heard about the great indian bustard 
it is very near the wind turbines are located very near to the great great indian mustard bird sanctuary this bird is from critically endangered category and we have to take care special care to protect this bird and uh, uh, when they constructed the uh, windmill they established a the windmill the problem is that they they have commuted commit the windmills in a very haphazard roadways which actually is a problem with all the projects another project is, another problem is with the land records there is table at panchayat level big players do all the sightings in la land record which is not good and the, uh, at the end i like to add that local people are unaware about company name cdm process stakeholder consultation they don't know whom to contact in case of emergency or whom to ask for damage next is more problematic case from south india south indian state of andhra pradesh uh, as name mentioned a local eco restoration initiative transformed the westland westlands into a dense community forest in villages of the kalpalali region uh, and uh, which is harmed by nalakonda wind farm project uh, local people with the help of local organization named timbuktu collectives facilitated the community based natural resources management and biodiversity conservation uh, with hard work of 20 years it got damaged with the badly implemented project uh, the choice of the location and not taking p local people's view while planning the project was a big problem local people complained to different departments also also made complaint to the cdm executive board uh, the local community group also approached national green tribunal but at the end a green valley turned into the wind state uh, you may be thinking that i am just giving a bad uh, i am just talking about the bad experiences there are good experiences also uh, when uh, this is an example of project where emission reduction generated from project are uh, real and verifiable but it will also uh, measurable uh, contribution to sustainable development of the poor and benefit uh, the community when uh, when some good organization take the lead and give direction give lead the people in a proper way you will find this good projects with you this is the one of the example because in 2005 2007 uh, in district in this uh, chiklampur district uh, adatus adatus is a organization they actually take a lead to a lead and uh, registered a cdm project with unf triple c this project is pro poor project and uh, after uh, the upfront uh, they got the upfront payment and able to build a biogas in a biogas units in the uh, villages after the seven year they actually made payment to the vulcan energy and after that each of the member who is having a biogas unit uh, started receiving the profit from the credits generated this is actually a very good project and uh, when uh, when the good uh, good intention and good technical know how person lead the project then you will get such good project so uh, since then uh, this project is a very good example let me take you to the another project another good example uh, this is uh, so uh, using solar power in salt farming uh, which is about replacing the this project is initiated by seva organization which is voluntary organization working for women empowerment as you can see from this slide that six of the sdg are uh, addressed through this uh, project this project is a renewable energy projects under the gold standard that makes use of solar energy for operating water pumps so women empowerment uh, emission reduction and many more so it is a very good project and uh, i think this is it from me and i now like 
to uh, request mahesh bhai to take over the other slides mahesh bhai please go ahead with this uh thank you phalguni and uh, very good presentation and given a overview about the cdm project particularly experience of india uh now the the uh, the objective of the clean development mechanism project is uh, very good because uh, which cover the environmental protection economics and technical well being to the project side but uh, reality is different not contributing the sustainable development or the economic well being just i gone through the checklist inbox that uh, our nepal friend ramcharit asked that uh, in the biogas plant the nepal government taken a money but uh, which is not given to the community uh, so it's a injustice basically the cdm project the concept is uh, economical and socially well being for the poor people because in this area the industries or whatever the project is and that is why the whatever the money they are getting they have to share with the poor people so uh, ramcharit uh, here is the yes you are right that is the injustice so some project had damaged natural resources and local people's livelihood halguni already told about the solar and all that uh, in india which is called the holy cow uh, they sang get a number of kind of uh, uh, credit Uh, but uh, if i talk about the banaskanda district of the gujarat uh, state the two ponds and 700 kind of malgaris has to migrate so which is not sustainable development and as per the goal of the 13 of the sdg which is uh, i mean violated uh, basically and uh, some someone also asked about the relevance of the environmental impact assessment of 2020 uh, draft and uh, this thing so i would like to say that uh, in this draft environmental impact assessment notification 2020 the holy cow project solar are uh, not that so and also we have a very good uh, uh, act in india which is called the land acquisition resettlement uh, rehabilitation and accountability and transparency now uh, the land is a uh, state level issue but in gujarat uh, we modified this uh, central act and there is no socio economic impact and that is why uh, even uh, forget about the environmental impact assessment but under this act also the wind farm and solar is not considered and the number of the people and the farmers and fishermen are facing a problem so it's a different story over here uh, that the provision of the cdm is a very good ideally but in the reality i mean we are sorry uh now uh, slide number 2 public participation hello uh phalguni no public ha uh, ha uh the provision is like a local stakeholder consultation should be carried out and reality is no proper stakeholder consultation also one question is that that how to know this process is still even our our long fight with the uh, cdm uh, authority and uh, uh, executive board at unf people see with the help of the at that time there is a uh, uh, cdm watch but now the carbon market watch but with the help of them we raised this issue of the uh, this uh, uh, cdm executive board and uh, then we lay down with the process of the uh, stakeholder and all that but even though even though the stakeholder it means the some few peoples are sitting in the five star hotel and uh, catch one to photo and submit it to the uh, board and get the clearance and uh, falguni already explained but i repeat it when we asked to the our uh, unf people see they replied that your host country is responsible and my host country replied me that uh, to get credit is the first phase and monitor will come later so don't worry and don't do much more monitoring even we do not have the system how to spend 2% of the money to the poor people there is no system a team develop uh, in uh, in in government yeah now yeah uh previous previously how many previous one hmm 
uh, now no cross checking of the provided information because the people are not aware about and uh, which is the agreement between the it's a it's a not legal binding uh, and not as per the indian law and that is why i cannot or we cannot challenge into the judiciary system so uh, if the carbon credit uh, project are not implementing properly the officially indian government cannot take any kind of action because uh, there is no act passed in an parliament so that is why the some extent we are helpless so just we have to raise the public voice and uh, raise this kind of question uh, please uh, sharing a benefit halman look provision is the uh, 2% of the certified emission reduction for the development of the local community but still i am already talked about the no information by the local people we ask number of the right to get information act we do number of the rti but even the indian government do not know how much money they received under the ciya if the government do not know then how could the local people know and how could we implement that 2% where is the 2% of my money and how how can we say that uh, uh, please spend on the community welfare so there is a totally hidden kind of thing no transparency at all the project proponent may directly share the amount with the respective village panchayat and monitor their development activities but uh, we did not find it uh, in uh, india uh, so no transparency of the spending the project proponent uh, project proponent may develop a plan and implement for the betterment of the villages falguni already given a very good example and we have the number of example here is the time is limit so we cannot put number of uh, example over here but uh, 99% as our, our experience and the case studies are saying that uh, the people are not uh, benefited out of the uh, cdm project uh, yes please next so our suggestion is uh, need to focus on the objective and that is why this webinar is so people can know about the how to move further and they can take part uh, uh, amita bhuj is not here in this workshop but he had a ask that uh, what is my role so now uh, your role is Uh, to monitor to get at uh, information uh, and then spread out uh, from the people so people voice became and then the force to the project proponent and the government make a environmental impact assessment and social audit mandatory so uh, 10th august is the last day to submit the uh, eia notification suggestion or objection so my appeal to the uh, indian people that uh, force to the ministry that uh, they have to involve renewable energy project into the environmental impact assessment notification and also uh, whoever the state who are not carried out a social impact assessment in the land acquisition act uh, they have also uh, do this kind of thing otherwise we cannot uh, come to know that what is the damage because of this uh, holy cow uh, renewable uh, energy project so strong monitoring is uh, uh, required and uh, the provision to the spend revenue on local participation uh, is must but unfortunately i already talked in my previous uh, few words that the like uh, corona is also a opportunity for some politician some rich people and disaster for others same way the carbon market and carbon credit is a opportunity for few people few project proponents and uh, for the mind of uh, uh, disaster for the others so uh, they one hand they are uh, exploring the natural resources and taking away the livelihood of the people and on the other hand uh, they are not uh, uh, getting benefit of the stadium project stakeholder consultation the fair participation uh, and transparent process is required and that is why uh, it is our role you if even it is a voluntary kind of uh, mechanism which is not mandatory but in the name of the voluntary this is, they are getting the like image uh, that look we are reducing the uh, carbon uh, and, and i i was into the people and that is why uh, the people like us and activists and social activists they have to uh, do the uh, monitoring kind of thing so fair participation and transparent process will occur next please so falguni already talked about but uh, we summarize do's and don'ts the 
uh, CSOs monitors the real world impact and implement the project and seek to uh, expose the project which do not respect the uh, rules. I think if the environmental impact assessment or the environmental protection act or the air pollution act or the water pollution act if they follow strictly then there is no need to take this kind of carbon credit but on the other end they are not uh, uh, fulfilling this kind of uh, rules and regulation and also they are getting a benefit uh, that's the sad story uh, cso promotes the implementation of the project which focus on the aspect of the uh, broader uh, than emission reduction also contribute to the sustainable development gender equality and uh, human rights also uh, uh, i'm not going to deep because uh, it's sees uh, cover uh, in a very good way what we say don't do this kind of thing develop project without the involving local community please please involve the local community they are the real monitors they are doing the social audit and they are the affected people so without the local community cannot allow this kind of project the developed project which is focused exclusively on maximizing the emission reduction without the generating sustainable uh, development benefit why we are telling is that because in the uh, sustainable development goal all all 17 goal which is more or less link uh, this carbon credit and climate change and that is why we are focusing uh, this kind of project uh, develop project which ignore the national or the local rules and safeguards so there is no monitoring system and that is why one hand the national green tribunal or the high court or the supreme court uh, doing the penalize on the other end they are getting the credit uh, and they are getting the fund also from the international finance corporation or the world bank or so and that is why uh, uh, we are telling that uh, it should be uh, considered. Uh, I think it is enough. If there is a question, then I will elaborate a little more. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mahesh. That's, um, that was very informative. And um, uh, also to Falguni at the beginning, some very interesting points uh, that you've raised and, and looking at the case studies. Um, we're going to we're going to move um, quickly into the Q and A so that we can um, try to get as many questions as possible. And I guess um, I'm I'm going to start off more of a general um, sort of questions uh, first to to Gilles. Uh, it's a question that came in from Ajita um, Tawari. Uh, she's asking what is the future of carbon markets in general and um, as, as Sidar is asking um will carbon trading solve climate problems um isn't it just business as usual maybe you can um start with that and then we'll we'll, we'll pick up with others sure thanks for the questions so what is the future of car markets uh of course very difficult to tell the future as always but um I, I i think what we can say is what we see at the moment which is um, a strong increased interest for carbon markets, for purchasing carbon offsets from private companies, a little less so from countries, I would say, um, but there is definitely increasing interest from private companies in part due to the, the pressure that they're facing to, to do something about uh, the impacts of their, of their activities on the climate. So in short, I think we can expect that the carbon market will develop a bit more, um, especially in the area of forestry credits um, unfortunately, um, we think that forestry projects are not suitable to, to issue carbon offsets. There are lots of problems um, associated with this, but it's an easy way, it's an easy project to communicate. And so um, it's something that companies like to, to finance and to purchase carbon offsets from. Whether on the question of whether this is going to solve the climate crisis, um, I mean, I think the answer is pretty easy and it's no. Um, carbon markets will not solve the climate crisis and definitely not on their own. There are some forms of, for example, carbon pricing or emissions trading systems that can contribute potentially to, to, uh, to fighting climate change if they are implemented together with broader climate policies. Um, but we don't really see that offsetting and the idea of, of compensating emissions really is going to solve the, the climate crisis because it's incompatible with the idea of just going to net zero. So at, at some, in the long term, we all need to get to zero 
Um, and in that situation, there are no kind of extra emissions that we can, that we have the liberty to trade around the world. So we don't really see a long-term role for, for offsetting. Okay, thanks for that, Gilles. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask the next question to Falguni, and this is looking at, we've had a couple of questions coming in relating to um, the financing that goes around this. Obviously, carbon markets is heavily involved in um, financial mechanisms that, that operate uh, in the background. Um, Falguni, what are, would you say, the impacts of carbon markets in India in terms of the investments of projects coming in um, has it uh, has it altered and uh, maybe you would like to speak a little bit on that as a part of CSR uh, regulation legal bindings uh, many companies are uh, 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 they are actually adopting to invest in RE project renewable energy projects uh, actually the big solar parks like uh, currently our prime minister inaugurated the Reva solar park which is the biggest solar park in uh, in the asia so uh, there are opportunities uh, and like uh, world bank and other financial institutes are giving loans to establish these things and private sectors as in india there are uh, legal bindings to spend few percentage of csr money so as a legal bindings according uh, in, in uh, as per the environment clearance rule uh, conditions they have to spend some kind of money in renewable energy projects so they are doing that only okay thanks uh, for that um mahesh um we have a f there was a, a question that came in uh, from suparan Superna um, is asking relating to your um, the, the presentations for um, of of Parabarmitra on the on the on the, on the projects on the good qual good quality projects that on the ground. Did you say um, he's asking? Firstly, uh, were the emission reductions um, of those projects? Um, have you have you got? Um, uh, uh, have you looked at the monitoring reports? Um, have you been there on the ground to verify these? Um, uh, and 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 what what makes you think that they're they're good projects? And um, obviously, we need to defend um, your your um, positions on those. Yeah, thank you, Supanaji, for a, a very good question. Yeah, still we are doing this kind of uh, monitoring uh, things because uh, we are monitoring the environmental clearance compliance. And that is why we are coming to know about the number of the project. Uh, we have also uh, prepared a document that uh, which kind of project they are not uh, uh, compliance of this uh, CDM, whatever it is given in. So it is uh, available. And whenever you say then or particular project then uh, and, and specifically Gujarat project, uh, we have a uh, list of this and with a good documentation. Yeah. Yeah, I like to add, I got an opportunity to visit both the projects at the ground level and also uh, got an opportunity to talk to the villagers. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, I, I, want, I wanted to jump a question, a couple of take some questions on on looking at the so, the social integrity. I think we've we've covered a little bit um, uh, in, the, in terms of the environmental integrity in, in, in in, pro, in the presentations um, and I was wondering if Sheil could um, and this this was a comment that came in from Tushar um, on the role of markets and sustainable development um, some people are wondering um, a little bit on is this will this be a continuation of uh, how things were done in the past um, uh, Miga is is referring to the old colonial patterns where the north continues to um, emit uh, pollution and, the, and 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 then just using the south to buy up the the credits. Um, what, is this is this the same um, way forward for future mechanisms under um, Paris? And maybe you can talk a little bit um relating to the um the pick up again on the grievance mechanism that you you spoke about earlier yes um so we have little time left but i'll do my best in the short amount of time um 
so on whether we can expect anything different from markets in the future, I think uh, we can hope that there will be better safeguards, uh, for example, under the Article 6 mechanisms that will be established. Um, there is a chance that there will, for example, be a grievance mechanism um, that's, that's still in the text at the moment. It's, still, um, it's not agreed, of course, yet, but um, we can hope that it will be there. At the same time, these are kind of improvements at the margin. So we're trying to get safeguards, we're trying to get rules, which in some, for some of them are actually common sense, like not double counting your emission reductions. It doesn't really address the, the overall problem of simply relying on offsetting. And, and as, as the question mentioned, um, this logic of global north countries purchasing emission reductions from global south countries, indeed, that is, that is a problem. Um, and that's why we don't really see offsetting as a, as a real solution and that we think uh, countries should should reduce their emissions domestically, and and uh, because everyone will need to focus on on that and and reaching net zero. Um, so maybe yeah, maybe I'll stop there to in the interest of time. But that's that's basically our our vision for what's coming up. Hopefully some improvements, yes, but we we can never be sure until the negotiations conclude. And in any case, um, even with these improvements at the margin, I think it's interesting to think about going beyond offsetting and, and thinking about alternative systems. How can we provide climate finance without necessarily exporting the emission reductions? Okay, thank, um, thanks, um, uh, Gilles. I, um, I'm, I'm gonna field a couple of questions. I'm trying to pack as many questions in as possible for this round. Um, and so I would, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one to Mahesh and then uh, uh, maybe Falkman, you can follow up with the, 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 action, the other one. Um, just looking at, you, you mentioned the, the environmental impact assessment and how it's very relevant, uh, Mahesh, at the moment in, in, the, in the discussions. Um, how, how, how can we ensure that there is um, a strong local stakeholder engagement in, um, in future projects, uh, whether they're, they're international um, origins? Um, that's for Mahesh. And then for um, Falguni. Um, we had a comment from a question coming in from Suma, um, who also had commented in the, the registration questions and was looking um, for a, a little bit more information on uh, building capacity space for women, leadership and engagement. And I think the general question was, how can you, we get um, more community engagement um, uh, in in the in, in these projects, um, so let uh, I'll I'll pass the floor to Mahesh and then maybe Falguni if you can follow up. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, and uh, uh, again, uh, good question. That the environmental impact assessment gives us a transparency and people's participation and stakeholder consultation. But if you remove this kind of uh, projects of like uh, renewable energy and all that. So people cannot get the information. And right now in India, we have a very good act, which is called the right to get information. Unfortunately, P2014, this RTI act is also became a handicap. If we are not aware about this kind of information, how to do monitoring? It's a tough question and that is why, by intention in this new draft environmental impact assessment notification, the number of the projects, they are excluded so they cannot come under the people's watch or people uh, scanner and that is why uh, the we need a strong environmental impact assessment and strong environmental protection act and implementation of that if it is not there then the judiciary will also become a handicap because our national green tribunal is very strong day to day they are giving a very good order and judgment and that is why to protect from the NGP or the High Court or the Supreme Court, uh, they bypass such kind of project into the law. Uh, if the law is not there, then how could we compare that the violation? So to hide the violation or allow the pollution, uh, they are removing all these things. Uh, so there is need that uh, if this come under the uh, Indian Constitution uh, environmental uh, laws, uh, then we can, or the people can uh, monitor and we can raise even at the uh, UNFCC level or the UN level uh, if the uh, sustainable development goal is not uh, implementing properly. 
so we can take part in the review process of the uh, sustainable development goal at a un level but without the information we can't and that is why by intention our government is not providing the information and they are excluding all this kind of project thank you yeah i agree with mahesh uh, because the transparency is not there which is most important thing local people don't have a local people don't have any information even a uh, organization like us uh, is not able to get an information uh, i think jeans also want to add in this uh, issue no sorry i think you you said everything you're muted andy sorry i think we've time for maybe um one final question um or well, actually let's let's um let's have a a little wrap up um for the for this i, I would want to to let everyone give a, a few few sentences to close on um their uh their their view on the future for carbon markets um uh, maybe with Falguni and Mahesh specifically talking about India um and uh, what's the hope we've we've had various um comments coming in um some views are are quite um quite negative towards the the the, uh, the future of um carbon markets and carbon markets in general that they are they so I think we can all agree that they have a, a somewhat of a bad reputation um, as, uh, amongst um, many of the civil society community. So um, on, on that, I would like to pass over for final thoughts um, for, um, for everyone. So um, Mahesh, would you like to start and then we'll go to Falguni and then Gio. Uh, I'm fully uh, not disagree with the uh, carbon credit and all, but if there is a proper involvement of the local affected people in the in the uh, beginning stage and the monitoring stage then it is all right otherwise the carbon credit it became a uh, csr earning and uh, also the public image uh, and the win win situation is there but without the public involvement in this carbon credit project uh, is meaningless and that is why uh, my only one this thing is public should be in center okay yeah uh, as a cso as a voluntary organization we also don't have uh, too much capacity uh, to work on this issue because it is a technical and complex thing uh, and to understand the carbon markets so i think we uh, as ourselves we have to empower ourselves better and then we will uh, then only we will able to uh, take messages to the people uh, that that is from me okay, yeah and on my side um, looking at the at the questions in the Q&A and from the chat i think it's quite interesting to see quite a diverse range of views some people asking how they can get involved and 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 benefit from these systems to implement projects others voicing strong strong um, concerns about the system i think we definitely shared uh, the strong skepticism about um, the role of, of carbon offsets to, to fight climate change. But regardless of, of what our position and what your, your thoughts are on, on whether carbon offsets are good or bad and, and whether they have a role to fight climate change, I think it's important to be aware of, of what they are and to understand that um, together we can, we can monitor what, what the real world impacts are. Um, it's very difficult for one single organization to, to do that on their own because the projects are spread out across the world. And so together we will be stronger to really look at the local level of what is happening. And so I encourage everyone to in communicate with, with us, with Parivar and Mitra and with, with others um, to really get together and understand what are the real impacts and how can we avoid negative impacts on, on local communities. Okay, thanks, Shil, um, Falguni, and Mahesh uh, for your contributions today. Um, like I said, we, I was I was trying to pack as many questions in as possible uh, to get. So I, I apologize if we didn't get round to answering everyone's question, but um, we will endeavour to to follow up with everyone. And of course, you can reach out to Carbon Market Watch and Parvara Mitra 
for any follow-up clarifications and questions relating to this. Um, we look forward to um, be getting in touch with you in the future. Um, as, we, um, as we all have heard, carbon markets, whether you like them or not, are not going anywhere for the, mean, for the uh, foreseeable future anyway. Um, and uh, the, the, the new regime uh, under Paris will uh, certainly um, create a, a number of uh, uh, situations where local communities um, and representatives um, will be able to, um, to get involved. Um, so we, we look forward to that engagement in the future um, with you all, and we hope that we can work with you more and um, maybe do more of these um, sessions uh, in the future. Um, thank you all again. Um, we wish you uh, safe health in, in these COVID times and um, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Okay, bye-bye.